I'm there. So, Phil, what's the, the significance of where we are today? Well, this is Plymouth High School for Girls at the top of North Hill. In 1642, during the English Civil War, a fort was built here. Nothing was here. A fort was started here, an earthwork fort called the Maudlin Fort. It was the most important fort defending Plymouth in the Civil War. It's well, the keystone. Was it's the keystone. It's the centre of the line. I've got a map here to show you its importance. This is the Maudlin Fort. This is Tavistock Road. It's in the centre, really, of the line. Newark is at the end of North Road West. Then we've got Pennycombe Quick Work, which is now above the train station. And to the right of, ha of Maudlin is Holywell. And further on is the Lipsom Work, all connected by trenches. But in 1642, work started on here, late in 1642, throwing up a strong earthwork. And work continued on this fort all the way through the Civil War. So it was here for four years, four long years. It was predominantly earth reinforced by wood and stones and whatever material was available. How big do you think it was, Phil? It was, I reckon it was nearly the size of the whole school in the Blind Institute. It was, this used to be the Blind Institute which, before it yeah. became Plymouth High School for Girls. <coughs> it, so it, it was, was pretty significant? It was the most significant of all the forts in Plymouth. How high yeah. do you think the ramparts would have been on it? Oh, at least eight to ten feet high. At least, yeah. yeah. And there was a magazine buried in the fort, locked up with a padlock. There were cannons here. And it became so important that naval guns from the shore were brought up here to, to reinforce it. And it, later in the war, a rampart was put next to the fort with a huge gun brought up from, from the seafront that was placed here in the Civil War. Um, from the Royalist side, you can see all these forts going up everywhere. And the sight of these forts on high ground put off a lot put off the royalists from attacking most of the time but during the civil war there were a number of attacks made against the maudlin fort mainly when prince morris came here in 1643 the summer of 1643 he had his men right opposite plymouth his army camps were based around seymour road hillcrest at uh, the end of mutley plain and oh, running down towards uh, opposite Lipson Creek. So there was major royalist works there. The sight of these forts, I think, were enough to put off a major assault because major assaults did take place during the Civil War, but they all failed. So occasionally they broke in, but most of the time these, these assaults failed. In 1643, in the, in the December, demonstrations were made against this fort before they actually assaulted lit down at Freedom Fields, the fight at Freedom Fields, the Sabbath day fight. They made a demonstration to draw troops away from that area. Demonstration? What's that yeah, about? it's just a preliminary, a small bombardment to attract soldiers because they thought they might attack. So they put more men here. But the most significant piece of history at this period was the fact that Roger Kneebone, the chief gunner of Maudlin Fort, was approached by a man called Karkeet, a mariner, a sailor who tried to get him to betray the fort to the Royalists. He informed the authorities in Plymouth about this and Carkeek was arrested and imprisoned. His two co-conspirators, Moses Pike and Henry Collins, Henry Pike and Moses Collins, were uh, fled the town. And the story is that they went to Prince Morris and gave him the information on how best to attack Plymouth, which resulted in the Sabbath day fight in December 1643. What's very obvious here, Phil, is these forts were sort of interlinked and they worked as a whole, didn't they? Well, you had, like I said, you had the five, eventually there were five major works um, and they were connected by a trench and a bank and hedges. And occasionally you, you hear about the forts falling down, collapsing because of the weather and um, being rebuilt. And one of, these, uh, hap one of these happened shortly after the Sabbath day fight to, when the Royalists left the area two of the forts collapsed, parts of two of the forts collapsed, which wouldn't have, uh, they say they, if they had collapsed before, the Royalists would have attacked, but they were, it wouldn't have happened, I don't think. And then anything. So how did they collapse? What, 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 what the, what, this, the 
difference in weather, the freezing weather. You the fact that it, yeah, it, it rains all the time. Yeah, it rains all it washes it away because it's on a hill as well. Ah, uh, of course. Yeah, so they had to keep, re they had workmen repairing these forts and because money was in short supply in Plymouth, because it could only come in from the sea uh, and you had to pay the garrison, soldiers won't fight for love. So workmen are the same. They would have to repair the works and you often read about in the accounts certain workmen being paid in coal, wood and money. So unlike the fortifications of the 1860s that were like built by professionals, would it be correct to say that these fortifications were like homemade almost? Yeah, they were homemade. Homemade forts thrown up, earthworks. Built by the people of Plymouth. Built by the workmen of Plymouth and soldiers. And the women came up. You often read about women uh, being paid for supply and drink and food for the garrison and to help him and build co and for burials they the women look, looked after the sick and injured and were paid for looking after the injured what would the inside of the fort have been like here? just an open area there'd be tents in there for some of the soldiers there was a, a always a horse guard nearby there was always a patrol a cavalry unit a small cavalry detachment near to um ride out and patrol the area between the forts and down towards North uh, Mutley Plain, keeping an eye on the enemy. No, so. I think you said earlier when we spoke, Phil, that there was a, a link from here to the other forts down this way. Yes. So what about that then, Phil, please? It could be, there's two roads there, Headland Park, but I think it's this road more, because it's connecting. They weren't, they followed the contours of the land. It wasn't a straight road, and I think the road behind the fort, like I said before, was a military road. It was clear and it, it ran all the way behind the forts and it um, could be used for rushing reinforcements and taking supplies to, to and from the earthworks. So you could get from this fort to the next fort quite quickly? Yeah, you? five minutes walk. They were not that far apart. Eldad Hill on the far left, the new work it was called because that was the last of the major ones, was a bit more, a bit further away. But in between these forts there were a number of mini forts thrown What's up. What's Just another small earthwork but smaller than these great works. These five big forts were called great works and in between you would have um, this li little maudlin work it was called. It was in between here and Pennycombe Quick and then closer to Pennycombe Quick would be the little Pennycombe Quick work and you've got one up there little Lipsom work. So every major work had small little ones in between. And of course, at this location, we can see we're absolutely on the crest of the hill, aren't we? Yes, we are on the crest of the hill. Now, what happened here in 1645, January the 10th, Sir Richard Grenville built up a strong army, a new army, about 8,000 men, seven to 8,000 men. And with this army, he launched a major assault against Plymouth at 2 a.m. in the morning of January the 10th. He launched attacks against Pennycombe Quickwork this one here and they said Hollywell and Lipson not too sure about those because they mentioned this fort and because it was done in the night time the royalists actually got into the fort and there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting here 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 they got into the fort um, there were the captain I think he was called captain one of the captains was badly injured um, a lot of men died but the royalists were saved by a man called Colonel John Birch who arrived with reinforcements just in the nick of time he had to control he had a, his own regiment was the Kent regiment came down from Kent and was garrisoned here for a few months uh, he he saved the day here um, but the fort was still here at the end of the war and you could still see parts of it in the 1840s 1850s but what it's would have happened if the fort had fallen in that they would have broken the line the royalists would if they captured the whole fort they would have rolled up the line. They could have gone on to the next one or they could have gone down to the town and uh, ransacked the so town. It would have been a very bad day for Plymouth. Yeah, but after a bit bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting and a lot of casualties, um, not sure of any of the names offhand, but you can read them in my book. So is that the most significant event? For this fort, yes, for the Maudlin Fort. There was a mini, mini fight. There was other fights all through the Civil War bombardment mainly I mean when Prince Morris came here he put a fort at the end of Mutley Plain along Mutley Plain where Ford Park Road is and tried to take on this fort but we were higher up and our guns just blasted hell out of it and they abandoned it in the end so we're standing on so much history aren't we oh yes really big history you wouldn't think when you look at it now this quiet little school that <laughs> was actually the, the site of a very big fight in the houses yeah along there 
Yeah. Yet on this site, history happens. Yeah, big history. Phil, once again, thank you very much. Thank you.